Our next keynote speaker is Tequila Chungyalpa. Unfortunately, due to severe illness of a family member, Tequila had to cancel all travel for several months, which also meant travel for this conference, and therefore Tequila is joining us to contribute her keynote via Zoom. We're very grateful that Tequila still was able to make space to give this off offering here. I'll give you a little background on Tequila. She is the founder and director of the LOCA Initiative. Tequila is an accomplished environmental program director with more than 20 years of experience in designing and implementing global conservation and climate strategies and projects. Tequila is the founder and director of an award-winning capacity building and outreach program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for faith leaders, religious institutions, and culture keepers of indigenous traditions. Her keynote today is on Earth as Refuge, our sacred work in the Anthropocene. Hi, Tequila. Do you want to say hello to the room? Can you see us OK? Hello. Hello, everyone. I am so sorry to miss this in person. It looks like a wonderful gathering. I managed to catch some of the speakers already. Um, it is 4.20 AM where I am, so I'm, uh, I'm quite grateful I'm not using slides for this talk. And I just get to talk to you directly and uh, hopefully have a heart-to-heart -heart connection, even though we're using technology the way we are. Um, and what else was I going to say? I'm just really grateful to greet all of you from the traditional ancestral lands of the Ho-Chunk people here in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin is one of the most beautiful forested places left in the United States. And a lot of that has to do with indigenous knowledge and wisdom in terms of how forests are managed and natural resources are managed. Um, and it is a really wonderful reminder of the debt we owe to indigenous peoples all over the world, because I'm sure many of you know that 80% of all biodiversity is found right now in indigenous managed lands. Um, and that is because indigenous peoples always put their bodies on the line when it comes to protecting nature. Um, so my title, I believe, is Earth as Refuge, Reframing Our Sacred Work in the Anthropocene. And I apologize if somebody has already gone through some of these points before, but I thought maybe I should start by framing what I mean by the Anthropocene. Um, it is a designation that we use for the current geological period where human activity is transforming the planet in extreme ways. Um, and there is disagreement among geologists about whether it should be called a geological event or a geological epoch. But the reality is that the term itself is used in academia and science and popular culture now. It's sort of escaped the boundaries of science in many ways. Um, and it's entered the, the our lexicon, the public's lexicon. Um, for me, I use it to refer to the most recent 500-year timeline that we humans are inhabiting. Um, this is a period that is marked by intense economic, industrial, technological growth that has less, led to profound changes in Earth systems. Um, you know, examples include almost 70% decline of global wildlife populations since 1970. Um, we have introduced over 140,000 synthetic novel chemical entities into the air, water, and land. We have no idea what most of these things do, right? We're still learning that, but we've already essentially opened Pandora's box. Um, and we have broken a previously unimaginable record where global warming has consistently exceeded 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial temperature averages for over a 12-month period. So we've essentially created a new record in terms of um, where we are with global warming and climate change. So when I say that the Anthropocene is a 500-year period, for me, it really begins with Western colonization and colonialism um, led by European nations. Um, in the 15th century, right, eventually European nations ended up covering and controlling 85% of the planet. And in those 500 years, we saw everything change. Global trade, local economies, local political systems. Um, essentially, what colonialism did was replace all of these things with a process that was as exploitative and as extractive as possible to benefit the empire back home. 
Um, and people, you know, there is a tendency for people to think that colonialism is something that happened in the past or to even think of it as a distraction or to think of it as something that is um, maybe not the main issue that is in front of us. However, for me, what I see when I look at what is driving all of these, you know, the three facts that I gave you to, to explain what the Anthropocene looks like, those are just three indicators of a massive onslaught of environmental and climate transformation, right? What is driving that is essentially what we call neoliberalism or capitalism that is so accelerated, that has so few checks and balances, no government oversight, no regulation, and essentially a growth at all costs mode of operation. Um, and the whole point of neoliberalism is to deliver profits to global financial elites um, by forcing austerity on poor nations. That should sound familiar, shouldn't it? <laughs> essentially, what, we, what I see when I look at neoliberalism is just a reincarnation of colonialism. Um, if you think about it in terms of environmental and climate issues, the U.S. and Europe alone are responsible for over 50% of all carbon emissions in the 20th century. Uh, we know that one third of carbon emissions since the 1960s is essentially created by 20 companies, right? Um, and that these, these companies, you know, have been shifting the blame to individuals, to us, to consumers, saying that we should be recycling, we should be consuming less. But the reality is that these are also the consumers, these are also the companies that spend in the United States over $200 million every year lobbying to delay, to control or block policies to tackle climate change. Um, another way of thinking about neoliberalism and how it is colonialism and it's a little bit transformed is to think about who the new empire is. What is the new empire? And that is essentially a global elite that we're seeing emerge. It doesn't matter if you're in the global north or the global south. The wealthiest 10% are responsible for over 50% of global emissions, while the bottom 50% is responsible for just 8% of global emissions, right? So the injustice is really stark. Um, I thought one other thing to point out, which doesn't get talked about at all or enough, is the role that the military industrial complex plays. Um, the military has managed to escape a lot of um, oversight when it comes to their carbon emissions, when it comes to their environmental footprint. The US military, if it was a state, a nation state, it would be in the top 50 largest emitters of greenhouse gases, but it gets to escape that kind of oversight. Um, and so when you think about the US military and then you imagine global military industrial complex, we're talking about something that, uh, a sort of a formula that was created by colonialism and that is still absolutely intact, right? It is a system that is propping up the empire. It's a system that benefits, um, the, the global elite, it is a system that uses military force, that weaponizes the police, that is very comfortable essentially having marginalized people bear the burden while everybody else gets to win in the system. Marginalized peoples are actually expected and meant to lose in that system. Um, and so it is designed deliberately to be cruel. It is designed deliberately to extract and exploit resources. And by that, I include human beings to incarcerate, to suppress dissent, and to keep the empire growing at all costs. So it can feel really daunting when we talk about neoliberalism because it is so firmly embedded in our constitutional, our social fabric in our societies. Um, there are very few alternative systems that are genuinely explored, right? Even at a theoretical level. Um, most of us struggle to imagine degrowth, something that is absolutely necessary for us to stop the ecological and climate crisis we are in. Um, in such a vacuum, I think a lot of us walk away feeling helpless, feeling overwhelmed. Um, in such a vacuum of imagination, of ideas, of uh, practical discussions, of political will, right? Um, it's really easy for us to experience hopelessness, for us to be overwhelmed, for us to feel rage, for us to get disengaged, for us to have despair, right? And all of these emotions that I'm describing are now what we recognize as ecological emotions. Eco-anxiety is one term that you see a lot. Climate distress is another term that you see a lot. So for us to actually 
address the, the deeper issue of what is driving the environmental and climate crisis, we really have to talk about our emotions and we really have to do the inner work. Um, it's really easy when we talk about degrowth and degrowth strategies. You know, Donella Meadows, uh, who is one of the writers that has influenced me the most, um, often talked about how growth is not possible on a finite planet, right? It's really easy to think of this work as activism and to think of it as separate from our spiritual practice. But I think this is exactly where our sacred work comes in, uh, where the inner work, the embodied spiritual work that we you know, that we aspire to do um, comes in. And part of that is resuscitating what existed pre-colonialism and what must emer emerge post-colonialism, right? Um, and I think part of that also is that we have to revitalize ways of being that are non-capitalist. We have to find ways to measure value that is not based on time or money, <laughs> very hard to do in our society. Uh, we have to revive what has died or is dying. And we have to let go of plenty of things, you know. It requires a kind of um, a really deep spiritual practice because we have to let go of the hubris that we humans are the most important species on the planet, that the, the sun revolves around us, the planet revolves around us. We have to let go of the idea or the sort of um, this hyper-individualism that we have grown to believe is part of the formula for personal success, right? This idea that we work, we earn, we get married, we have our kids, and then we live by ourselves, our kids go off, right? This, and what we're seeing right now in real time is an epidemic of loneliness. Um, the Surgeon General in the United States actually declared last year as loneliness is one of the big um, health crises in the United States. And what we see when we see people really locked in this hyper individualism is a, a, a number of things. So psychologically, it's really harmful. It, you know, loneliness actually can kill. Um, in terms of community, it is really difficult because you don't trust community. You don't believe that putting energy into building those relationships actually will result in something fruitful and something important. It is a deep distrust of your governing structure, of governance, of democracy, right? Of the election system, what have you. It really breaks down that distrust. And so this kind of isolation actually almost guarantees that you end up being in an echo chamber where you slowly start unraveling. And in that echo cham chamber, what's going to happen is you're going to be preyed upon. Um, it's also very strongly linked to uh, people who believe in conspiracy theories. So one of the things that we have to let go of is this hyper-individualism because it's not serving us on a personal level. It's definitely not serving us in our societies. Um, Something else that I think really um, we need to we need to address all of us who are spiritual practitioners, all of us who are working in especially um, caretaking jobs and uh, sort of you know taking care of young people in particular, taking care of older people, taking care of vulnerable people, is the disconnection we have with nature. I think something that I've seen in that has emerged in the last especially fifteen years is language that really disassociates us humans from nature, almost almost language that talks about humans as being a pest on the planet, of um, you know, essentially not having a right to be here. And the realities, and I, I'd love to point this out all the time, it's really important, is that the Anthropocene is just a blip in the timeline where humans have been alive and have existed on this planet. So in 200,000 years, 500 years is just it's gone like that. We can reverse this thing. For the majority of that timeline, we have actually lived on the planet and coexisted with other life forms without obliterating them, right? And now in the last 500 years, what we've done is entered a pathway unwittingly that has ended up meaning incredible species loss, incredible environmental loss, and, and ironically also a kind of threat of extinction of our own species. But ultimately, if we look to what heals that, it really is the connection we have with nature. It is that we as a human species, as one species on the planet, also belong. 
that the earth wants us to thrive just like she wants every other species to thrive, right? She wants us to turn to the sun. She wants us to grow. She wants us to bloom just like she wants every other species to bloom. We do belong on the planet. As you can probably tell, I am um, really inspired by indigenous wisdom. There are elders I'm really privileged to learn from, work with. Um, and there are concepts that emerge in indigenous wisdom, especially in North America, which is usually described as kinship and reciprocity. And a lot of um, kinship and reciprocity work and analysis um, by incredible thinkers like Melanie Goodchild and Kyle White and others um, are positioned on this idea of relationality, which means that we do not think of ourselves as individuals separate from everything else. We are actually in relation with everything else, right? And the moment we think like that, what we're doing is engaging in systems thinking. And also, it parallels really closely to the teachings I was brought up with, which is from Tibetan Buddhism, um, and, and reminds me of just the sheer beauty of Buddhist teachings on interdependence. So when we talk about relationality and interdependence, I thought maybe we can just take a moment, all of us, um, and just sort of take a moment and just allow ourselves to feel what that is, right? So sit back, <laughs> just stretch yourself if you need to, wiggle around if you need to. Um, just imagine that there is a string that's pulling you from the top of your head up, and then the string, we let it go. And we relax into our body. And I want us to take three breaths together. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. And now I want you to take a moment as you inhale and you're holding the oxygen and letting it out, where that point of separation is between the oxygen in your lungs and who you are. When we talk about interdependence, what we really mean is that we are literally inseparable from everything else. There is no point in our body, in our lungs, in our blood, anywhere where we can say, aha, <laughs> this is where I, the Kila Jungyalpa, comes in. And that is where the other nature oxygen exists, right? This oxygen in our lungs, we would not be alive. We could not exist. We could not be without it. And this oxygen is coming from all over the planet, phytoplankton in oceans from far away, thousands of miles away. Right? Plants outside of the cathedral, plants that are in the building. We're breathing one another's air right now. We are literally inseparable from everything else. And if this is part of our practice, whatever our spiritual practice is, if we allow ourselves to meditate on this, what should happen is an experience of realizing there is no other, right? That if we cannot ourselves separate where that point is of where oxygen en ends and we begin, where the food in our body ends and where we begin, right? There is no other. And this is, you know, for me as an environmentalist, as an environmental scientist, I, I absolutely am so um grateful and full of joy when I see how this is mirrored biologically as well, right? If we think of the planet for a minute, the planet is a closed loop system. You know, it has its atmosphere, its hydrosphere, its lithosphere, right? It has space and air and land and water. Um, but for most part, I mean, so there is some energy that leaves it and comes in. Um, I love to joke that sometimes all that comes and leaves are meteorites and egotistical billionaires, right? But that this is what we see, the exchange, uh, very tiny amounts of dust. Um, but mostly it's a closed-loop system. Everything that happens to us happens in this planet. 
everything that happens, all life that we know happens in this planet. Um, all of us, all living beings, we are born, we thrive, hopefully, we die, right? And then we decompose, all of us. Some part of us is always recycling. We get to give birth to life again and again. We get to be part of something greater. We get to experience interdependence and relationality. You know, before we were born, after we we're here, we're still continuously part of life. Um, and so, as my intro said, I um, created and run the LOCA initiative. The vision of the LOCA initiative is that um, inner community and planetary resilience are interdependent. We cannot achieve any one of these things alone. We have to work on all three. Um, and the reason why uh, we, we picked this, actually this vision emerged from a dialogue with 60 faith leaders, culture keepers of indigenous traditions, scientists, resilience experts. Um, but one of the deeper reasons why we wanted to take on this work is because we understand who is carrying the burden of these ecological emotions that I mentioned, right? We are seeing struggle at two levels. There is enormous physical injustice that marginalized peoples are having to bear yet again, right? The greater part of the burden, you know, being at risk, being more vulnerable to climate disasters, being more vulnerable to all the planetary boundaries um, that we're crossing. And the psychological injustice of having to carry yet another kind of trauma that is already um, on top of everything else you're carrying. You know, so many folks have in, um, intergenerational trauma. Um, if you are indigenous in particular and your identity is tied to land, um, seeing land being harmed is like harm being done to yourself or to your family. And so there really has to be something that allows us to shift, that allows us to rebuild our relationship with nature, find non-capitalist ways of, of being activists, right? Being movement builders, um, of breaking the loneliness that I mentioned earlier, the hyper-individualism, right? And putting down our hubris. And to me, I think a lot of that comes with how we see the planet herself. You know, if I was to tell you a story, a scary story, right? And I was to say, listen, just imagine that you are in this freezing place. It is incredibly scary. Nothing wants you to live there. It is a huge void, right? Unimaginable void. You're completely alone. And suddenly a door opens and it is warm. It is safe. You can breathe. There is food for you. <laughs> there is warmth, right? Would you not fall down on your knees thanking all the gods that you have found refuge? And is that not what our planet is? Refuge. Because as far as we know, there is no other planet that harbors life in the entire universe. <sighs> right? And if you break down the etymology of refuge, it really is fascinating because there is, you know, forget, I think it's like to flee, right? The idea is that as a fugitive, you get to flee and you find a place of refuge. It is this temporary shelter that people are looking for desperately. And here it is given to us unconditionally, such an incredible act of compassion. And so earth is our refuge and we can take refuge in the earth. We can actually acknowledge that we take refuge in the earth. As Buddhists, some, many of you will know that taking refuge is actually the first step to most people um, even understanding or acknowledging that they're Buddhist, right? For someone like me who's born in the tradition, it's probably the first prayer I was taught as a child. Um, and we take refuge in the Buddha, the awakened one, in the Dharma, which is the path, right? And the Sangha, which is the monastic and the lay community. So these are the objects of refuge. And I'm just so struck by how this ritual in itself is is seen as the first awakening <laughs> to becoming a Buddha, right? That this is the first step to us awakening ourselves to becoming a Buddha. 
Um, and it seems to me that this ritual can be transformed for us. For those of us who are really trying to see how we can spiritually, psychologically, you know, in an embodied way, physically, actually create rich rituals that heal us, create rituals that bring us back from the Anthropocene. And so my interpretation of that would be that we take refuge in the greater one self, this completely interdependent self that I described, right? That great incomparable bliss, the awakened one. And the Dharma, when we take refuge in the Dharma, that is the sacred path each one of us is trying to create right now, why we have gathered here together, right? Trying to create a sacred path out of this. And finally, the Sangha, that is all of us, community. We cannot do this thing alone. When we think about the empire and it's overwhelming, the only way we can rise out of that is to lock arms with everybody else. We have to be in movement. You know, as I said earlier, we have to be in movement for psychological reasons, right? We have to do it because we have to give power to governance systems that are fair, that represent us. We have to find ways to break the stasis, right? We have to find ways to rebuild the things that matter, that are not measured by money and time. And that is friendship, love community, solidarity, all of those things. It's really easy to forget that those are sacred acts. One of the things I've learned, especially um, working with black womanist uh, faith leaders in the United States is how important joy is, how important it is to center joy in the work we do. Um, you know, when I talked earlier about the injustice, one of the things that became really obvious to me was that um, for people who think of spiritual practice as distress reduction, for people who, for example, lots of folks do mindfulness because they want to calm down or they want to feel better, right? Um, there is a certain privilege that is locked in that idea. That means that you can actually shut the door on distress. You can go into a safe space. You can curate your room, you can have a beautiful orchid, a Buddha statue, I do, right? We can do all of those things and we are able to bring our distress down. But if you are black or indigenous or a person of color in the United States, if you are LGBTQ, if you are poor, if you, um, in, you know, are rural in some parts of, of the US, and of course, everywhere else in the world, then that is a huge privilege of being able to shut that door. We do not get to control the points of distress, right? We do not get to control how other people treat us. We do not get to control how the policies other us. And so there has to be a different way and a different method of building our resilience. So when I talked about inner community and planetary resilience, what I really mean is this ability to, to survive, to even thrive, even under danger, even under threat, to be able to bounce forward, right? Um, and so what is really important is that when we think of these rituals we must build, we balance the distress reduction with the centering of joy. Because for those of us who cannot actually control points of distress, what we can control is joy, creating rituals of joy, you know, um, having events, having cookouts, having festivals, right? Uh, one of the loveliest things about joy is that the moment you experience it, you want to share it. Isn't that the first instinct we have when we experience it, right? You turn around to share it with your loved one. That's the first instinct we have. So we must trust that instinct. We really must trust that the things that give us joy are important and that they are also sacred and that our rituals must ultimately be joy-based for them to be ethical, for them to be non-capitalist, for them to be interdependent, right? Um, and for them ultimately to build a community. Thank you. So any comments or questions, responses? Yes, right over here. If you could just make your way as close as you can to the aisle. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nadine. Hi there, thank you so much. Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me, Tequila? Tequila? Sorry, I want to say Tequila with the T. <laughs> um, thank I you. Can. Um, okay, cool. Thank you again. I'm really curious. So I'm U.S. based as well, and I work for an organization that has climate commitments with universities. Um, UW Madison is part of that. But what I'm actually curious about around your work is thinking about how sometimes, you know, our this work can be like we're living in an echo chamber and then also um, this being in a university, working in a university, sometimes sometimes being part of that system that you're talking about, like the neoliberal liberalism as the new colonialism. And sometimes I struggle working with universities myself of being like being part of that system a little bit. So how do you kind of balance being part of sometimes in, in a way we all are, right? Um, being part of that system while also trying to build the new world while we're still in it and having to kind of bow to it in our own way. Thank you, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I didn't, I chose not to do slides, but if I had done what I would have probably shown is one of the projects that LOCA has. Um, we have a project where we work with evangelical church leaders on environmental and climate is issues. In the United States, uh, I'm sure all of you know, uh, evangelicals in particular um, tend to, the, or I should say, some of the larger percentages of climate denialists happen to be evangelicals. Um, and when I created LOCA and I knew we were going to work with faith leaders and build bridges between religion and science, um, my criteria was actually who is not in the room. So my criteria was who is not showing up for the UN COPs, who is not invited to the mainstream environmental and climate movements. And um, the partnership that I have is with actually Arasha, which is probably known to a lot of you. Um, I don't know if Dave's in the room. <laughs> Just a shout out, hi Dave. Um, is with Arasha, World Evangelical Alliance, um, and Care of Creation, which are three big uh, evangelical organizations, obviously. And the model that we use is we bring evangelical pastors from all across the US to Madison for five days. It's a closed room. We sign a contract. Nobody gets to say who was there, repeat what was said, any of those things. And we essentially, we always have a conflict mediator in the room. And essentially what we do is have a dialogue around where we agree and where we don't. And what is always fascinating to me, two things that are fascinating to me is that it's not the scientists that change the minds of people who are on the fence or people who are really outside of our echo chamber, right? It's actually other pastors that change their mind. And so it's really important that we understand that we are not always the right ambassador. <laughs> we are not always the right messengers. And part of our work is to find the people that actually speak to the people who are not listening to us, right? The second thing that's really fascinating to me is sooner or later, what ends up being openly discussed in these conversations is that it is not that um, even the most hardcore uh, climate denialists, it is actually not the science that they are denying. It really is the implications of the science. And when I talk about colonialism and empire, I want to be really clear and link it back to that because the empire is floundering and people that have benefited with the rise of the empire are terrified of, the impl of what is to come if the empire falls, right? So it is a human, uh, very natural human instinct to grab and to just say, I don't want anything to change. And part of that too is this fascinating psychological thing that happens because the expectation is that there will be revenge, harm will be done to us, right? And it always, I mean, I'm always just so blown away by how so much of the dialogue actually um, sort of um, almost pivots when there is this moment of grace and forgiveness in the room. And suddenly everybody gets to kind of stop the posturing, right? Stop, stop that instinctive reaction we have to defend ourselves. Um, and the project is really important to me, not because we in, are doing it at scale, right? This is a, we have reached a few hundred people at most. The project is really important because of its modeling power. Because what I love to say is I, as a Buddhist from the Himalayas, a brown indigenous woman, as heathen as it gets, 
can build bridges with the evangelical church, nobody else has an excuse to say it's not doable, <laughs> right? And so it's really important that for all of us that we don't, we don't create limits in our imagination, in our, in our ambition, in our hearts of what is achievable. You know, we are in essentially out of time when it comes to the Anthropocene. We are now fully experiencing climate impacts, right? We're experiencing the breakdown of other planetary boundaries. We are out of time where we sort of um, uh, can choose to not be courageous, right? Um, and so I think the other part of your question that I'll just say really quickly about, um, about uh, being in the systems we're trying to transform is that I think it's completely doable. I think it requires a movement. There always should be people outside the systems that you're allied with because you always need the check and balance. You need the, the carrot and the stick essentially, right? And that's part of really just skillful activism. Um, and that we just launched a course on edX, which is a uh, uh, psychology of deep resilience, which very much asks that question of people. How do we transform the systems that we are part of? Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tequila. We have time just for one more. If there's any one more, yes, right here. Jenny, if you could just stand, thank you so much. Hi, um, thank you, Tequila, for your uh, presentation. I would just like to ask how much engagement have you had with um, the Catholic Church and Laudato Si, the encyclical by Pope Francis, um, with 1.4 billion Catholics around the world, um, not, of, not all of whom, of course, have read Laudato Si, but um, it has been popularized throughout the, throughout the world. Laudato Si has this uh, concept of integral ecology, which is very close, extremely close to what you've been talking about and it has the same analysis that you've been talking about of neoliberalism. But it also contains, and not just Laudato Si, but all of Catholic social teaching has um, approaches to, to change the economy. And we're yeah. talking about economic reform fundamentally. So I'm interested not just in the, the spiritual practices, but in the terms of how we address political economy. And you, you alluded very briefly, you mentioned the poor once. But for me, that's a very important component here. And the poor, not only in what we were, might used to have called developing countries, but also the poor in the West, the post-industrial mm -hmm. towns, for example, will be completely abandoned by this process of globalization and neoliberalism, particularly in the last 40 years, who end up being left behind and have no voice. So I see a potential solidarity between those poor people in the West and the poor in other parts of the world who, who the environmental activists tend to focus on more. I think there's an, uh, an unhelpful estrangement mm -hmm. between those different uh, areas of, of great um, suffering and poverty. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested to hear your engagement with the, the Catholic interpretation of, of the situation and particularly around how political economy needs to change. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, great question. Um, so I've been working with faith leaders now for 16 years. Um, and I, I can't remember what was said in my bio, but uh, I created a program at the World Wildlife Fund. So I used to work for WWF for 14 years. Um, and I created a program at World Wildlife Fund called Sacred Earth um, in 2009. And one of the projects that I worked on was with the Vatican and with the Archdi Archdiocese of Rio. Um, it was when Pope um, Francis was returning to Latin America for the first time as the Pope. So incredibly significant moment for World Youth Day, which is the largest pilgrimage um, on the planet. So estimated two to three million young Catholics were gathered in Copacabana Beach. Um, and we were able to work with the Vatican and with the Archdiocese to create these videos that talked about the Amazon as a Catholic issue and the protection of Amazon and indigenous people's rights as a Catholic issue. Um, I find that, um, I always love to joke uh, as a Buddhist that I feel really comfortable in the Catholic setting. It's all the pomp and the maroon and the gold. <laughs> it's like I might as well be home. Um, but I have had a very long-standing partnership with the Vatican and with the church. Um, 
And one of the advisors that we have, uh, uh, Father Josh Drumkuritadam, is the um, coordinator for the Dicastery of Integral Development, which is responsible for the Laudato Si platform. I think one of the reasons why we, as LOCA, did not work specifically with the Catholic Church is because they are actually really well resourced to take on climate issues and climate justice in particular. Um, the Pope, um, you know, the Laudato Si, but also his other encyclicals and his other writing, um, he really makes it a point to talk about the inequity, to talk about in injustice, to talk about poverty and how it's always the poor that end up bearing the burden. And so I think for any of us who are trying to think about who we want to ally with, when we look at the work that is required to dismantle neoliberalism, then I think what the Pope has created with the Laudato Si platform is really an amazing, um, an amazing idea. Uh, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> we might be out of time, but I'm happy to uh, talk more about this on email. Yeah. Thank you, Tequila. It's now time for our break, and you have until 11.25. Please get some refreshments, get some fresh air. Please engage with our comments wall and talk to one another. Enjoy your break. Thank you, Tequila, so much. Thank you so much.